Kingston, a great place for boating and fishing, a place where London's holiday makers come by Southern Region electric train to join the little river steamers, either for a short local trip or for the whole two-day journey upstream to Oxford. And so I came again, Miranda, and I'm standing just where we stood together some months ago on that same little pier with one of those useful combined rail and steamer tickets in my pocket, watching the early mists lifting from the river and the little knot of fellow passengers booking their trips. Strollers on the towpath, although used to the daily departures of these steamers during the summer months, stop to admire and may be envious as we breast the stream convoyed by tendered waterfowl. And from the deck with a reciprocal interest, I watch the local schoolboys fishing in their own Tom Fiddler's round. Now along the route Cardinal Wolsey took over 400 years ago to his great palace at Hampton Court. Court, that harmonious blending of the 16th and 18th centuries, a noble pile where the Tudor rose blows in a garden of Georgian calm and serenity. The magnificence of royal palaces and the friendliness of riverside homes are things that Thames links within yards of its leisurely flow. On this silver stream, the river people pass the summer days at their own peaceful pleasures, in their own particular way. To them, no man in a constant hurry is really quite civilized. The old red duster floats bravely above the wash where churning up a stern, and Skipper, with eyes fixed ahead, is bent on getting us to Bellware. Bellware Lock, and it's well known, so typical of all the Thames locks. Focal points where we trippers and the river folk meet in friendly communion, where the arrival of our boat is an event where the empty hours are suddenly filled with a gathering of people who meet in a brief encounter and then depart, perhaps never to meet again. It's a pity to pass Romney with undue haste. It's a charming little place, but Salter's guidebook shows that our next stop is at Windsor itself. Yes, there's the landing stage now. I think my programme will be a quick lunch first, then a stroll round. There's an hour and a quarter to do it in. Windsor is. The southern region station is practically on the river, and if ever one thought of doing so, one could stand in a train and throw a stone on the castle walls. William the Conqueror built the original castle Miranda, and successive kings have added bits which somehow managed to present a perfectly harmonious whole. The guides here are fond of showing you those corners closely associated with Henry VIII. And the splendor of that glorious epoch that followed his death still seems to linger within these royal walls where the red-coated guards provide a splash of color and pageantry beloved of Windsor's visitors. They stand for something, something that makes us quietly proud of being British. Or am I a bit sentimental? Somewhere I read once that the railway bridge at Maidenhead is the largest single span brick bridge in the world. Well, in any case, it frames a pretty view of the old Maidenhead Road Bridge, a milestone on our upstream journey and in our social history too. Maidenhead, a 
favorite spot in those days of Edwardian peace and prosperity, when river girls in starched muslin dresses and picture hats and bewhiskered gallants in boaters and blazers thronged the reach to Bolter's Lock. Ascot Sunday is still an occasion at Bolter's, but today its sylvan beauty is ours alone. certainly looks wonderful today, its hills cloaked in the leafy wonder of the summer-laden trees, trees whose tips are lightly gilded by the Midas touch of approaching autumn. Stream boat from Henley is a cheery sight after all that concentrated loveliness, Miranda. I wonder if his passengers are enjoying their trip, as I am mine. Here is the real Thames, the teeming metropolis forgotten. The visitor accepts the river's gift of pleasures that only she can offer, pleasures he enjoys with the placid contentment of the munching herds in the neighboring meadows. if we don't tire of too much beauty at a single stretch, Mother Thames brings us the diversion of another lock. By now, all aboard here are more than just nodding acquaintances. We've discovered each other's destinations, we share an appreciation of the passing scene, we greet the lock people with an instinctive goodwill and compare their working methods. Then we consult the guidebook once more and find we're on to Marlow. Marlow, why there's music in the name. Put here today, the clank of machinery breaks momentarily into the peaceful sea. The passing glimpse of the complete angler excites an Isaac Walton thirst. Sorry we can't stay. I think we're being followed. To take no notice, we are not in a hurrying mood. There are gentle backwaters to admire here, and Mother Thames now opens up her treasury to reveal gem after gem of verdant loveliness strung on the silver thread of this gently lingering stream. Take the trees glide past us, brushing with gentle strokes a mute cerulean sky. And in the water's shining flood, the weir posts stand, white beacons, guiding us to sleepy Hambledon, whose lock welcomes us with open gates. How beautiful they stand, these stately homes of England. And for how much longer will they remain so? I wonder a little sadly. But my reflections are brief. There is a stir aboard and an air of preparation. As we pass a little leaden goddess in her Palladian temple, then sweep on into Henley's magnificent reach. Now under the handsome bridge, 
past one of the most pleasant pubs I know, the Angel, and up to the landing stage. Here at Henley, passengers on the morning boats from Kingston stay the night. And Henley's a pretty spot to stay a while, a place born of and living in close intimacy with the Upper Thames. Yet it's but an hour's journey by train from London. But Henley's regatta, the first in the world, is its just claim to fame, and a lovelier course it would be difficult to imagine. Several steamer acquaintances are bidding farewells here. Some are returning to Kingston, while we continue on upstream in search of verdurous reaches, English landscapes, and more of this river's soul-soothing tranquility. It was a bright inspiration that brought me on this sentimental journey, Miranda. As I sit on the deck, watch the western region trains speeding to London, I feel I've no need for them yet. I enjoy sharing this river with the dwellers in its valley, perfectly content to let time and the world slip by unheeded, while for those to whom time means everything, well, alongside this silver stream, the iron horse races, serving the many for whom the river's treasures have no immediate appeal. Reading, the halfway house on my journey, with its ruins of a once great monastery. But its biscuit manufactories and its seed gardens flourish, and it's pleasant enough down by the stream here. Our little steamer sweeps beyond the reach of chimney smoke to those quiet spots where Mother Thames is minded tentatively to explore the countryside, winding sinuously through this green and pleasant land on her way to Maple Durham. A nice feature of these smaller locks is their intimate family atmosphere, where the lock keeper's relations, or anyone else who happens to be around, lends a hand, putting shoulder to the wheel, or whatever is the right term, to get us on our way. Perhaps they sense our eagerness to be off as quickly as possible, for before us lies the lovely Pangbourne Reach. Whitchurch Lock, on the threshold of that area, where the local people, with plenty of time for everything, use these river steamers almost like buses. In this part of the valley, Road, rail and river vie with each other, offering their several services in friendly competition. Trains dash to and from the metropolis, but for me, who have no need to hasten on this occasion, the river is my choice. the tiny flower-strewn lock of Goring is upon us. This is generally a busy spot, both because it is a favourite with us trippers and because the local youth regard it as a rendezvous, which indeed it is. Enchanting backwaters are but a stone's throw from our steamer's deck, and away over there, the tumble of the weir murmurs incessantly in our ears. The village can show you pubs where summer visitors drown their thirsty conversations in the amber depths of good English beer. Country cottages, which would delight the eye of Christmas calendar designers, are common in this sleepy little town. A humpbacked bridge links Boring with Streetley, where the old Roman road crossed the famous Ichneald Way. 
Now, Caesar's legions are replaced by riverside tea drinkers and husky rowing types for whom this stream has endless attraction. Not an easy place to leave, but Stuart was insistent. Plenty more to come, he said, mentioning places I've half forgotten. But Skipper remembers them all, and what they'll reveal for our pleasure. So, while Stoker with beautiful energy shovels on the fuel, our sturdy little engine races obediently. Downstairs in our cozy saloon, Edith is making tea and sandwiches, which she will presently bring up at our bidding. Ah, this is a pleasant way to make a journey. Ticket. I bought mine at Waterloo Station, a combined special rate rail and river one. There are lots of these combined tickets available, and they do save money and bother in rebooking. What's that pub? The Beachland Wedge? We must be nearing Wallingford. Well, that's a good thing, too. These morning boats from Henley stop there for lunch. Remember we had some hot lobster with delicious sauce there last spring, Miranda? Sadly, these green sedges sigh as we pass smoothly through their interlacing fronds, past the sleek herds of unheeding cattle who while away their days chewing reflectively, past those athletic types for whom this stream provides another outlet for their energies, and on to Wallingford, with its intimate associations with Roman, Saxon, Danish, and Norman conquests, its quaint streets, its architectural charms, and, of course, its hot lobster. a nice break, Miranda. And now where are we going? Oh, there's that oldie worldy house. Remember it? Just where the stream begins to curve so invitingly around the open meadow. Now we've reached that lovely little bridge of Clifton Hamden, with its tiny village nearby, almost too Disney to be real. Then Cullen's toy bridge, gateway to its miniature lock beyond. Whenever I come to Abingdon's charming reach, Miranda, I feel just a little sad because I know my trip is nearing its end. Today the village looks very peaceful, with the sun splashing its river front, as it did on that day when we explored its Inigo Jones Town Hall and its Tudor Arms House. Remember? the bend to that picturesque bridge, on whose parapet we once sat together watching the tiddlers in the stream. Abingdon, with wars forgotten, has regained its native tranquility. I wish I could linger here a while, but already we're gliding through the green fringed waters of Newnham, cool and inviting in the afternoon sun.
Steward tells me that the next lock, Stamford, is the deepest on the river, with a fall in the water level of nine feet. Well, you'd remember it, Miranda, with its leaping arabesques of water tumbling in before our bow. Goodbye, Sanford. Again, it would have been nice to stay or just half an hour to talk to your lock keeper, drink a cooling pint in your Riverside Inn. But now for Italy, and then the beloved Oxford. Reluctantly, each of us aboard here readjusts his mental focus. Already Oxford's reach lies before us like a great blue carpet spread in welcome. And in the distance, the houseboat, enjoying a long vacation rest from the turmoil of huskies shouting in their stately depths, rides serenely on the waters of this ice. journey's end, and before me the old folly bridge proclaims the fact. And so I collect my belongings. Coat, rug, no, that belongs to Salters. Ah yes, and my combined rail and river ticket. So that's all, now off we get. Oh, but you too are still lovely, Oxford with your shining streets where myriad bicycles go drifting by, with your spires that dream up from your scholarly walls, aloof in their aura of age-old charm. So strange a contrast to the changing tides of perpetual youth that ever storm your venerable halls. A contrast that provides a harmony that is unique, a harmony that is you, Oxford. Sweet Thames run softly till I end my song. How well that Elizabethan Spencer phrased it for me, Miranda. And now, back to... Fine day. No time to be in an office. I could look at that view of our boats at Folly Bridge all day if I had the chance. But in a while they'll be loaded and away to places like Ifley and Newnham and Wallingford. And I've got work to do too. Although that's a pretty hard word to use for the job of trying out holidays for other people. The other folk at Folly Bridge are a bit green-eyed about it. Gadding about, they call it. And I don't blame them. So this time, I took a camera with me to show them the sort of thing they're writing about all day. It was London Airport this time to look at the new public enclosure on top of the great new Queen's building. 
And if you don't go there this year or next year, you'll have to go there one day. And so for you too, here's a chance to see what a remarkable and interesting and exciting place it is. Our tours usually combine rail, river and road journeys. I expect these particular three hours are more popular with the young ones. So I started off my one-man organised tour from Oxford Station. All forms of transport interest me, which is just as well in view of my job, and trains are old favourites. Every time I start a journey, I always think of the organisation that makes a rail journey so easy and comfortable and just think of the power turning those great wheels. Whenever a river flows, there is a rich mellow flavour to the scenery and nowhere more than in the lovely Thames Valley. All the way along the line are new scenes and new places. From the wide windows of my compartment I can see the river showing itself, first boldly and then shyly through the trees, like a little girl in a new party dress. Here is a richly fertile land of green hills and lush water meadows. You couldn't live in a place like this without getting some of the Thames in your blood, and the railway people are no exception. They take a great pride in their stations, stations like Taplow, where the red and yellow dahlias proudly match the shining coaches of the train. And so I arrived at Windsor, one of the loveliest combinations of secluded streets and well-stocked shops that I know. No one could fail to be impressed by the towering majesty of the castle which dominates the whole scene. Famous as a royal residence and for the many glittering state functions it has seen, its battlements and towers have loomed over the river meadows for many a long century. William the Conqueror first made it a royal residence, for that it seemed exceedingly profitable and commodious because situate so near the Thames. The wood fit for game and many other particulars lying there meet and necessary for kings. Since then, scarcely a rain has passed without adding to its buildings or traditions. For those who have the time to visit the castle, there is much of interest to see. St George's Chapel, where Knights of the Garter are invested, and which is the last resting place of more than a dozen of our kings and queens. The enormous bulk of the Round Tower, the glorious view from the North Terrace across Home Park, and much more. That sign reminds me, I must press on. I met some old friends on the boat. Some of the officers on the steamers, like this one, have been with the firm for years. They know the river like the backs of their hands and can tell you a tale or two about the history of this shining water. Incidentally, it is nice to know that you can hire a boat for a private party and it's a jolly good way for a club or a society to spend the day. We first make for the stretch of narrow water known as the Cut, leading to Rumney Lock. From here the distant spires of the chapel and buildings of Eton College crown the watery glade, and in spite of the distraction of the summer sunshine and the pretty girls on this boat, it is stirring to remember the great men who spent their days at the college, Wayne Fleet, its first headmaster, and also its founder Henry VI, whose statue stands in the centre of School Yard.
and so to run me lock, while willing hands help to send us on our way, and a smiling lock keeper hands us the means of keeping cool, while we prepare ourselves for the stretch of water that passes through Windsor Little Park. It was this stretch of water that was so beloved of Isaac Walton, and to this day anglers find some of the very best fishing, especially for the koi and heavy Thames trout. Datchet, the next place to pass, is a pretty riverside village. The purser told me that this is the best place to hear nightingales. But in the summer sunshine all was gaiety, and the children played along the banks, their laughter every bit as sweet as those dulcet birds. The King's Boathouse is on the opposite side of the river, and it is said that Charles II, that merry monarch, used to indulge in the not-so-royal sport of catching gudgeons. All along this stretch of river are reminders of the past. Here under Frogmore we are quite near the spot known by repute to all lovers of Shakespeare, where Falstaff received his immortal ducking. But that was only yesterday by comparison, when you learn that close by is the site of a long vanished palace built by the Saxon kings of England. However, that's history, and this is a day when we can all enjoy the 20th century sunshine and wave with a comfortable feeling of good fellowship to those who greet us from the banks. a lock, and still time for many things. Time to watch with ever-growing interest the goings on around us. Time for refreshment brought by willing hands. Time to look at some of the never-ending variety of life which lives upon this water. From Old Windsor Lock to Runnymede, the riverbank teems with life. Delightful little riverside homes with their flower-laden gardens abound, and here and there low banks densely grown with willows, which lean gracefully over to kiss the ripples of our wake. fails to please. It is a place of never-ending delights. To those who live upon its banks, who take their sport upon its gentle waters, or to those craftsmen who spend their lives fashioning the boats that will give pleasure to so many. soon Runnymede is reached, and here is a little cottage on the island where John, nursing wrath in his heart, called his barons to conference, and where in a single day the great charter was drawn up and discussed, and eventually signed by the unwilling monarch. Every bit as unwillingly, I will soon be on my way. Yes, I hate to leave the new friends I have found on the steamer, but I must let it go on its journey to Kingston while I take the road to my destination.
Above me, on Cooper's Hill, there stands a tribute to those men of the Commonwealth Air Forces for whom there is no known grave. From the Tower of the Memorial, the eye travels down to Runnymede, where were recovered the liberties which these men fought once more to keep. And in the distance, on clear days, the ancient tower of Windsor Castle stands on the one hand, with the ultra-modern buildings of London Airport on the other. And that reminds me of the main reason for my excursion. Here we are. It's pretty clear we are near an airfield. Even if the futuristic radar scanners don't tell us, there's no mistaking the sign on this inn. But I mustn't let myself be distracted. We must leave the main road here and make for the big tunnel which takes us under one of the main runways to the central terminal area. This tunnel alone was quite a feat of engineering. It is nearly 700 yards long and has footpaths, cycle tracks and roads in both directions. These roads, by the way, are designed to cope with 2,000 vehicles an hour. That's as much as a lot of our main roads have to take at holiday times. As you leave, you can't miss these bright yellow airport coaches. They're used to carry passengers to and from the more distant aircraft. Here's the first of the permanent passenger buildings. This particular one deals with all the European flights and those within the British Isles. On top are proudly flying our own civil air ensign and the flags of some of the 30 airlines which use the airport. Up near those flags is part of the new roof garden for visitors. And from that magnificent viewpoint, I was able to gain this wonderful view of the world's most modern aircraft. I made some inquiries and found that London Airport is easily the busiest in Europe. In 1955, nearly two and three quarter million passengers passed through it. And on the busiest days in summer, there were over 600 aircraft movements. At the peak hours of the day, that means an aircraft is landing or taking off every two minutes. It takes a great deal of skill and ultra-modern equipment to regulate a flow of traffic like that with speed and safety, and in this tower there is an abundance of both. All nine stories are most cleverly planned, and the controllers claim it is one of the finest in the world. Much as I would like to know more about the tower, I must press on with my job. These roof gardens, they'll look a bit different next summer when all the visitors are up here. Still, there seems plenty of room. Hmm. Looks as if some flying saucers have landed from outer space already, but they're really only skylights. From up here, you get a really wonderful view across the tops of the new buildings and over onto the surrounding marshalling aprons. That terrace below us is known as the waving base. It's meant for friends and relations who come to greet passengers or see them off. It looks as if a flight is due in now. They'll be seeing their friends soon, but over on the other side of the building, there's an outbound flight just arrived on a BEA coach from Waterloo. The coach stops outside the passenger channel earmarked for the flight, and the receptionist greets the passengers. Now, what nicer reception could anyone want? They're clearly in good hands, and their friends seem pretty comfortable as well. You really seem to get the very nicest people here, if you see what I mean. This is such a vast building that it was all getting rather confusing, until, when I was passing one of the bookstalls, I saw this little book. In no time at all, I had a much better idea of what was going on. Also, the announcer was a great help. I learned that this was the Elizabethan-class aircraft carrying the silver wing service to Paris, and that this was a Scandinavian airliner going over to the hangars. You lucky people, Paris in one hour's time. 
A small boy told me that those engines are Bristol Centaurus 661s, rated at 2,625 horsepower each, and that the Elizabethan has a span of 115 feet, a length of 82 feet, and an all-up weight of 55,000 pounds. Now, when I was a boy, it was railway engines. Ah, well, there she goes. It seems that not only small boys are interested in what goes on at the airport. I suppose they were having a busman's. I mean, a pilot's holiday. Now, there's a lovely aircraft. Even I knew it was a Vickers Viscount. And although my small friend could probably reel off a lot more technical stuff about it, I know it is one of the most comfortable ways of carrying nearly 50 passengers about very quickly. But wait, what's going on down there? Oh, I see. It's yet another arrival. This time, an Aer Lingus Viscount from Dublin. This is the Irish airline. You may have noticed the Shamrock. And they have regular flights from Dublin to London and many other places every day. The passengers go up the ramps into the passenger building so it won't be many minutes before their friends up on the waving base will be able to meet them in the main hall. Meanwhile, back on the apron, it seems as if another aircraft is due. The marshaller is getting the details of it over his walkie-talkie radio. As soon as he knows where the aircraft is to go, he'll wave it into position with his orange-coloured bats. You'll see that the aircraft has to be manoeuvred to rather fine limits, and these men are expert at it. Let's have a closer look at this BEA Viscount arriving. There's the stewardess, both hands full and still coping with all her passengers. Meanwhile, the porters are getting the luggage out onto the truck, which will take it to the customs hall. As this aircraft is a little distance from the passenger building, there is a big yellow coach to take the passengers right up to it. And there's no time to waste on the aircraft they have just left. Baggage and freight must be cleared, and the aircraft prepared for another load in double quick time. There they go, their journey nearly ended. It hasn't taken them long to fly to London, so there must be no delay in their passage through the airport. Remember, this is air travel, where every minute counts. It looks as if they're getting this aircraft ready for another trip. Back on the roof gardens, I could see right across to the enormous BOAC and BEA hangars in the maintenance area. That is where teams of highly skilled men work night and day checking over these big airliners at regular intervals to ensure that the high standards of safety that are required are maintained. A part of the London airport tour that is always fascinating is the coach trip through the hangar area. One cannot help marvelling at the host of people needed to keep them flying. I learned that over 4,000 people work in the BOAC headquarters building alone. It's nearly time to go now, and as we take a last look at these magnificent aircraft, and think of the way that British aviation has progressed in the past 35 years, we cannot help but admire the brains and fortitude of the men who were the pioneers. It is amazing that in such a short time, the adventure of flying to and from the far ends of the earth has come to be regarded as everyday routine. To many pioneers, like Sir John Alcock and Sir Arthur Whitton Brown, who made the first non-stop flight from North America to the United Kingdom, and whose statues now gaze serenely at all the hustle and bustle of this most modern airport, flying was the great adventure that made all our modern air travel possible. My job takes me to many places, but I am sure I shall never forget the day I went to London Airport to see how they fly.